cop is a cop. Well, cops no. are white. And you know, <laughs> yeah, and he may be he may be a very nice man, but I haven't got the time to figure that out. You know, all I know is he's got a uniform Legal. and a gun. You know, and I have to relate to him that way. Because one of us is gonna you know, one of us may have to die. One of us probably. You know, in New York, there's a, a big campaign going on to humanize the um, policemen. And they have post uh, billboards upstate. And they have a picture of a big cop bending over this little blonde girl. Mm -hmm. and, and the signs say, and some people call him pig. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to buy a billboard. I told a friend of mine, I want to buy a billboard and show this big cop and this 14-year-old kid with 30 bullets in him and say, and some people call him peacemaker. If you follow me for a while, you know that I cannot stand Eric Adams' black ass. <laughs> In fact, the very first episode of this show was me breaking down the absurdity of rappers like Ice-T calling Eric Adams the hip-hop mayor of New York City when the man actively criminalizes hip-hop. And I told y'all then that I am a certified Eric Adams hater, but... I'm a hater with lots and lots of reasons. So today, I'm finally going to give you all the reasons why everybody hates this nigga. So I asked my Twitter followers to tell me why they hate Eric Adams. And the most common answer was, he's a cop. And I'm actually glad I didn't see too many detailed reasons for why folks didn't like him. Because it means that I have so, so, so much to tell y'all as someone watching that man like a hawk. Y'all are gonna need picket signs when I am done. But something I've also noticed a lot of whenever I talk about Eric Adams is a lot of people going, I can't believe New York has elected a cop. What did New Yorkers expect when they elected a cop? Oh, why did y'all vote for a cop? So before I give you the million reasons to hate Eric Adams, I wanna first start by adding some nuance to how New York City ended up with Eric Adams, because it's not as simple as we got what we asked for. Something everyone needs to remember about New York City, the most diverse city on earth, is that it's home to thousands, if not millions of immigrants, many of whom, like myself, cannot vote. Then you must also consider the amount of New Yorkers battling poverty and literal homelessness who would be unlikely to vote. So many of us didn't elect Eric Adams because we can't elect anybody. No matter how vocally and politically tapped in, a lot of us may be. So just always bear that in mind. Eric Adams won the Democratic primary for New York City in June 2021. He took office January 2022. There are a few things you need to understand for context about the primary and New York City just to understand how we ended up with Eric Adams. This primary was atypical for a few reasons. First, we were in the middle of a global pandemic. And yes, yes, I know we are still in the middle of that pandemic. What I mean by that is that New York City was still acting like it. New York City was locked down for longer than most places in the country. We transformed the entire city in so many respects. The businesses that were even still open were operating out of makeshift wooden boxes on the streets, many of which we still have around because I think we've all gotten accustomed to it. Hospitals were still full. People were still dying in droves. Protests were happening daily. There was a whole lot going on that distracted people from being able to be tapped into the election and all of the individuals that were running in the race. Which brings me to the second factor. There were a million people running in this race. Listen, the relevant candidates were Eric Adams, Andrew Yang, Scott Stringer, Maya Wiley, Catherine Garcia, and Diane Morales. That does not include these people I never even heard about. Sean Donovan, Raymond McGuire, Aaron Foldenauer, Art Chang, Paperboy Prince, Jocelyn Taylor, and Isaac Wright. Who are these niggas? <laughs> And there was a circus happening around each and every one of these candidates. Do you remember how much media attention Andrew Yang and all his cringy antics took up for a man who only got 12% of the vote? Uh, Greg's the, Greg the champion, some green cheese, a banana. How you doing, bro? Ooh. Ooh. Can you imagine a, a New York City without bodegas? I can't imagine it. Let's not have to. All right. See you soon.
With side note, we actually really need to study the phenomenon that is Andrew Yang being as well known yet wildly unelectable as he has proven to be. My God. Scott Stringer was a favorite of some people early on, and then he was accused of sexual abuse by a woman who worked for him during his 2001 campaign for public advocate. Then, at the ninth hour, to my personal dismay, because I was a fan of her campaign, Diane Morales' campaign blew up when her staff tried to unionize. And while all this is happening, Eric Adams is out here rolling out ads that would have you thinking this motherfucking cop is a goddamn civil rights leader, which is central to why he was the strong favorite amongst black voters. And listen to me. I am not exaggerating when I tell you this man was running civil rights leader looking ads. Please look at this. These hands have seen rough times and I've got the calluses to prove it. Growing up, my parents struggled. I was beaten by police at 15. So I became a police officer to battle racism from within. As Brooklyn Ball president, I worked around the clock to fight against COVID. I'm Eric Adams. I'll be a blue collar mayor. I'll rebuild our economy while tackling violent crime and bring New York back. Paid for by Eric Adams 2021. Nothing impresses me about Eric Adams, and I do mean nothing. But if it was going to be something, it would be the ability to simultaneously invoke police brutality to pander to the black community that has been brutalized and rightfully distrust the police by presenting himself like someone who gets it, like someone who's experienced brutality, while simultaneously being a motherfucking cop in the same breath. Nigga. Those were the kinds of ads he was running and targeting towards black and brown communities. Meanwhile, the man was vocal about not only his refusal to support reducing NYPD's budget or staff, he told us he was going to bring back NYPD's anti-crime unit that's history of abuse was so rampant and documented they had been forced to dissolve it the year earlier. Think about that. Think about that. The man was campaigning on ending the exact same kind of police brutality he was planning to enable. And that's exactly what the fuck he did. Because he would go on to restore that unit and bring back stop and frisk. Or finds the NYPD is still using stop and frisk and that too many people are searched unlawfully, especially men of color. A court appointed monitor finds most of the people the NYPD neighborhood safety team stop and search are men and 97% of them are black and Hispanic. The report also finds there was no reasonable suspicion for the stop in more than a quarter of those cases and a third of the searches lacked any legal basis. The safety teams were disbanded after George Floyd's murder, but Mayor Adams has since brought them back. But we'll get back to that later. And not only will we be distracted by the circus of controversies happening around way, way, way too many candidates, we were especially fucked because of what I believe played one of the biggest roles, but always seems to get left out of the discussion, is that it was the first introduction of a ranked choice voting system in New York City. We had a million candidates and a ranked choice voting system. Nigga! I'm not sure why people overlook this, but here's the breakdown of the primary. There are a few things I want to call your attention to. In the first round, Eric Adams had 30.7% of the vote, Maya Wiley had 21.4% of the vote, and Catherine Garcia had 19.6% of the vote. By the time the final ranked choice voting math goes down in the final round, Eric Adams beats Catherine Garcia, not even Maya Wiley, the person who received the second highest amounts of votes in the first round. But in the final round, Eric Adams beats Catherine Garcia by the tiniest margin, 50.4% to 49.6%. Then, in the actual mayoral election, when there's only about 20% voter turnout anyway, Eric Adams was against the Republicans' raving lunatic Curtis Siwa, the leader of the Guardian Angels, a nut-ass organization that Eric Adams actually supports, of niggas in red berets patrolling the subway like vigilante with this kind of energy. Also refuse our previous invitations to join the Neighborhood Watch, mm -hmm. but we could use your support. Our motto is, neighbors watching neighbors. But I actually want to show y'all a clip from the mayoral debate between Eric Adams and Curtis Siwa because it provides so much to unpack and shows you, one, just how fucking unserious New York City politics are, and two, what we're dealing with here, what our options are here, because I think we need to be reminded. Because before I really get into my bag, and I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of it, I just want to show you what the other choice was. Take a look at this. Mr. Siwa, your opponent has at times we've heard over the last couple of weeks several times called you a clown uh he has called you uh, a, a trump mini me i wanted to see your reaction to that but i also 
by your own admission, you faked crimes, a kidnapping, a robbery in the 90s. So why should voters in New York trust you? Well, you know, it's interesting. He calls me a clown. I guess I'm Pagliacci right across the street. As you know, uh, I could be in Lincoln Center. That's so beneath you, Eric Adams, especially after you wrote an op-ed piece praising the guardian angels. Did I make mistakes early on? Yes. And I've apologized for them. But talking about faking, you fake where you live, Eric Adams. We still don't know where you live. You live in Jersey, most people say. And then you blame a homeless person for your accounting problems with the IRS. For the second time, you've gotten in trouble for wrong filings, and you blame some homeless man that you had as your accountant. I hope you don't appoint him, if you get elected mayor, the budget director for the city of New York, because Bill de Blasio, your friend, has done enough damage to this city. I can't imagine why you wouldn't just take responsibility. Man up, Eric. Say, it's my responsibility, and I'd like to know where you actually live, because you keep faking that. <laughs> Let's break that down, shall we? The first thing I find incredible about this clip is as the moderator is describing Siwa. By your own admission, you faked crimes, a kidnapping, a robbery in the 90s. So why should voters in New York trust you? You quickly realize this nigga is a grade A nut. <laughs> but here's where it gets really sick. That grade A nut responds and starts eating Eric Adams the fuck up with a bunch of claims that are true. <laughs> Let's review Siwa's claim, shall we? First, Siwa says it's shameworthy for Eric Adams to now call Siwa a clown when he, Eric Adams, penned an op-ed supporting the Guardian Angels. Let me tell you why that's important. Because the main issue with Siwa is the Guardian Angels. If you were going to call Siwa a clown, and he is, you would think it would start with the Guardian Angels. This is a group that throughout the 70s and 80s was known for being a group of white men who would patrol the subways through only their perceived authority as white men targeting black and brown New Yorkers. And yet, that is precisely not the issue Eric Adams has. He supports the Guardian Angels. Second, Siwa says Eric Adams is a liar and that he doesn't even live in New York City and that most people think he lives in New Jersey. Fact check. Listen to me and listen to me good. Listen to me. Eric Adams lives in New Jersey and we all know it. This is by no means the most important reason to dislike Eric Adams, but it does demonstrate that he is a lion ass nigga. It came to light during Eric Adams' campaign for mayor that he actually lives in a co-op with his partner in Fort Lee, New Jersey. <laughs> ah, but when that came out, <laughs> that was a problem for Eric Adams because, you know, to be mayor of New York City, you actually have to live in New York City. And at the time, he was the Brooklyn Borough President. So he got the ever willing to help police look good ass New York Times to publish this Fugazi ass article doing a tour of his Brooklyn home. <laughs> and child, that man was scrambling so heavy to make it look like he lived in that apartment. They put a bed in the living room with the back to the door. <laughs> and this is the, and this is the fridge full of a meat, you know, mind you, Eric Adams is a vegan. And according to Eric Adams own taxes, he don't live in Brooklyn. Third, Siwa accuses Eric Adams of blaming a homeless person for his accounting problems with the IRS. <laughs> Fact check. What is Siwa talking about here? Well, the city and political New York reported that Eric Adams, who purchased a bed apartment from the federal government when he was the NYPD captain for just $361,000, did not pay taxes for 2017, 2018, or 2019 on any rental income from the tenants and reported that he spent just enough on repairs to write off the entire amount that he collects in rent. And he also reported that he does not live in the Brooklyn apartment building he now claims he resides in. Why did he claim that? Well, property owners are allowed to write off their expenses on rental units. So it's either he doesn't live in Brooklyn for real, at which point he's lying to us now, or he does live in Brooklyn and he was lying to us then when the IRS brought these things to light. Eric Adams said, and I shit you not, the accountant made mistakes because the accountant suddenly became homeless and child, 
You know how homeless niggas be tripping? <laughs> I swear he actually did say something to the effect though. Oh, he became homeless and I mean, he was making all kind of mistakes, but y'all would have said it was fucked up if I fired him and he was homeless. Oh, okay. And to all the people saying to themselves, we could have had Maya Wiley. You know what? Yeah. You right, dog, you right, we could have. At the time, it was between Maya Wiley and Diane Morales for me. And I vocally leaned Diane Morales because Maya Wiley proposed to take at least $1 billion from NYPD's budget and to reduce their staff by 2,250 officers. But Morales wanted to cut their funding by at least $3 billion and reinvest it into social programs and alternatives to policing like violence responder services. And just a little side note to how this propaganda just have folk misleading the public. Look how this article states that Morales wanted to cut NYPD's funding by $3 billion and that that's more than half the department's budget. But that's not an accurate picture. In 2020, NYPD's operating budget was $5.6 billion, yes. But the city still spent over $11 billion in policing because it gave them an additional $5.4 billion in fringe benefits and pensions and debt services and a bunch of other shit. And that's not including another almost billion dollars in overtime spending. Anyway. Eileen Morales simply because she wanted to take the most from NYPD. But if I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, I would have been full throatedly behind Wiley. We should have consolidated around Maya Wiley. But hindsight is 2020, and I definitely didn't and don't possess the ability to determine New York City elections as it is, so it is what it is, but I'll eat that nonetheless. That being said, I know it was not all a fluke. A lot of people did actually vote for Eric Adams. He was the first ranked choice for most of the people who voted in the Democratic primary for mayor. Part of it is like, he didn't win the majority of the vote. You know, it was, it was a stacked race and he won like a small percentage of, 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 of the vote. And it still is, is, is shocking to me that he was even in the running at all, given what we saw him doing and saying in the lead up. And he was on record on a show advocating for 400 to one student to teacher ratios. Like that should have been a campaign ending thing. I mean, he on camera thought it was gonna show, a, show him that he was a tough guy by dismantling a kid's skateboard ramp to show that he was gonna crack down on like public health and safety issues. He was advocating for the criminalization of graffiti. He was disparaging New Yorkers in service level positions as low skill people who didn't belong and couldn't ever belong in a corner office. He was saying all of the things Democrats and Republicans think about when it comes to, you know, wanting to lock up more people, um, maybe disdain that they have for the people who they serve or they're supposed to serve. But he was saying it all out loud and people still voted for him. So I wanted to actually explain why those who voted for him did and why I wasn't surprised that they voted for him. And I also wasn't surprised that he was much worse than so many people anticipated. Picture, Picture it. it. Sicily. Sicily. <laughs> it's like not. <laughs> It's like, nah, picture, picture it. it. It's New Year's Day 2020 in New York City when Andy Cohen is drunk as hell celebrating the departure of de Blasio. <laughs> Don't go on a rant. Do his victory lap dance. <laughs> After four years of the process, Trump, as the mayor of New York, the That's only thing the that year. Democrats and Republicans can That's agree how, on I mean, is what a horrible <laughs> mayor has been. I tweeted, this would be funny if I did not know that Eric Adams is about to make de Blasio look like child's play. And I was right. Listen to me, I was highly critical of de Blasio, but not for one second did I ever delude myself into thinking Eric Adams would not be much, much worse. For the same reason that I knew New Yorkers were going to elect him. He's a black cop, which makes him New York City encapsulated. New York City is a place that likes the appearance of being progressive and diverse, which is why New York City brags about being the most diverse city in the world and an always reliable blue state while maintaining the most racist and regressive institutions, policies, and practices imaginable. So do not believe the hype. This is not a progressive utopia. When people are presenting it to you that way, they are basing that off the appearance of the thing, the appearance of the place, the pop culture, the fact that it has Democrat administrations across the board. But what they're not thinking about is the fact that New York City has the most segregated school systems in the entire country. Did you know that? 
that in this city of almost 10 million people, 42% of whom are white, Rikers is a pretrial detention center filled with over 90% black or brown people who've not been locked up because they've been convicted of a crime, but because they do not have the money to purchase their freedom. Compare and contrast that to New York City's neighbor, New Jersey, who abolished the cash bail system in 2014 under Republican Governor Chris Christie, then you'll understand that New York City just has a better publicist. If you bear in mind that this was New York's stop and frisk city, and that even after it was found unconstitutional, it is still New York's stop and frisk city, that this is New York, and this is New York, and this is New York, well, then you'll understand the formula for why we have Eric Adams. I would like to introduce to you an academic concept that most Black people simply understand through our lived experiences and the countless examples of it. But Derek Bell, the father of critical race theory, introduced the concept of rules of racial standing in his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Few Blacks avoid diminishment of racial standing, most of their statements about racial conditions being diluted and their recommendations of other Blacks taken with a grain of salt. The usual exception to this rule is the Black person who publicly disparages or criticizes other Blacks who are speaking or acting in ways that upset whites. Instead, such statements are granted enhanced standing even when the speaker has no special expertise or experience in the subject he or she is criticizing. When a black person or a group makes a statement or takes an action that the white community or vocal components thereof deem outrageous, the latter will actively recruit blacks willing to refute the statement or condemn the action. Blacks who respond to the call for condemnation will receive superstanding status. And that is where Eric Adams comes in. In 2020, we had protests in every single borough every single day of the summer. Thousands of people demanding an end to police brutality and calling for the police to be defunded. White liberal New Yorkers did not want that shit. They did not want to defund the police. They did not want an upheaval to the system. They believe in that system, but they don't like being associated with the critiques of that system. So what offers a better shield than a black cop? They get to maintain the same system, worse than it actually, but we'll get back to that. They get to maintain the same system but pretend it's progressive because the guy is black. They get to scratch their heads and play confused when anyone suggests that maybe this black man is deliberately and systematically going after other black people because he's anti-black. But they're gonna play confused because America is invested in pretending they aren't aware that or how black people internalize anti-blackness and wield it against other black people. America is invested in this collective gaslighting because how else could it persist if not? That is why, as the New York Times reported, quote, Mr. Adams, who cast himself as a blue collar candidate, led in every borough except Manhattan in the tally of first choice votes and was the strong favorite amongst working class black and Latino voters. He also demonstrated strength with white voters who held moderate views especially some data suggests amongst voters who did not have college degrees. A coalition that has been likened to the ones that propelled President Biden to the Democratic nomination in 2020. And there's a lot to unpack there because while all those different groups voted for Eric Adams, they voted for him for different reasons. While moderate white people voted for Eric Adams, it can't simply be said that the black people who voted for him voted for him because black voters are moderate or because that's what appealed to them. And it certainly cannot be said that black people have the same commitment to the status quo or to policing that white moderates who voted for Adams did. It's important to remember that Adams tapped into entirely different narratives to appeal to those different voters and understand that the propaganda, police loving rhetoric he used to appeal to the white moderates was not what he did to engage with the black community. Remember the police brutality condemning civil rights activist type ads he was running I showed you earlier? Well, combine that with palling up to black candidates and rappers he trot out or the rousing endorsement he was getting from people like Hakeem Jeffries. That you you oh, were Eric Adams there? Yeah, Good. I've known him a long time. <laughs> oh yeah? You know him? For How decades. okay so so you have anything positive to say? Well, I guess that yeah, you're a good person to talk talk to. <sighs> well, one of the best uh one of the best small group political speeches I ever heard was from him. When, uh, when Hakeem Jeffries, who I used to be pretty close to, uh, first decided to run for Congress, uh, a group of us met for a little fundraiser and Adams gave the kind of opening introduction for Jeffries about, you know, why we should get excited about him. And it was amazing. So much better than Jeff any speech that Jeffries has ever given. 
So he's got charisma, you know, he knows how to talk to people. He was just more active about pandering to old black voters in a particular kind of way. And I do mean emphasis on older black voters. When folks in Harlem say, quit sending the police to solve our problems, when folks in East New York say, quit sending the police to solve our problems, that's maybe when we'll see some change. And I think that's the one reason we are seeing some funding for the community violence reduction stuff, because that is what people in those neighborhoods increasingly are saying. Yes, there's still the little old church ladies who come to the meetings and say, bring back stop and frisk and why can't we put more of our own children in prison? But increasingly, there are uh, lots of voices in these communities who say, you know, we need community-led solutions to these problems. Look, I think there's a generational divide here. You know, my students were not taken in by Eric Adams. My, my uh, you know, I teach at Brooklyn College. My students, especially for the courses that I teach, are predominantly African American, Afro Caribbean, uh, and they're none of them are fans of Eric Adams, but their parents voted for it. Now that we've covered how Eric Adams became mayor and why people voted for him, let's unpack who Eric Adams is at his core, a black cop. Because trust that Eric Adams is a cop through and through my boy, the epitome of the black cop, as well as a registered Republican for a significant amount of his life. It is our city against the killers. When you ask most people why they hate Eric Adams, they're probably going to tell you because he's a cop. But they're not just saying to you that they don't like cops, therefore they hate Eric Adams. What they're trying to communicate to you is that Eric Adams is a black cop in the depths of his soul. And I am making an emphasis on black cop because there is something special, negative, but special about the black cop. And that's something that Eric Adams himself recognizes. The funny thing about my beef with Eric Adams is that deep down that nigga agrees with me. He knows that we live in a police state because that's precisely why he became a cop. It's why he continues to adorn NYPD jackets at most press conferences despite being mayor and having retired years earlier. It's why he prioritizes the needs of NYPD above all else because he knows that there is nobody more powerful than the police in a police state. Eric Adams cares solely about power and he will conceal who he truly is when in certain black company, but he's always told us who he was. That's why before he even took office, Eric Adams let it be known that he did not care about the opinions of the council members or anyone who was not a cop. This happened after Eric Adams stated his intention to continue the use of solitary confinement despite the tragic deaths of Khalif Browder, Laylene Polanco, and Brandon Rodriguez. And the majority of the New York City Council members wrote a letter asking him to reverse his decision. For people to continue to say Eric supports solitary confinement, that is just a lie. I support punitive segregation. I am not going to be in a city where dangerous people assault innocent people, go to jail, and assault more people. The one thing that's different from everyone that signed the letter, letter and Eric Adams, I wore a bulletproof vest for 22 years and protected the people of this city. And when you do that, then you have the right to question me on safety and public safety matters. I think I know a little something about this. Don't write a letter. Call me and speak with me. That is how we're going to resolve this. There's a body of people that are coming into the city council. They have no desire in moving our city forward. Their desire is to be disruptive. What I am going to do, I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to stay committed, undistracted, and I'm going to grind. If they like it or not, I'm the mayor. Please note that Eric Adams likes to rename practices that have already been declared torture, unconstitutional, or controversial. Look out for that a little later on when we talk about stop and frisk. But essentially, this nigga be rebranding shit. Like, no, it's not solitary confinement. It's punitive segregation. It's restrictive housing. Which is also fucking nuts that he thinks punitive segregation sounds better than solitary confinement. It's giving very much torture. It's giving very much torture. I knew 
and the folks that I work with and that I organize with, and uh, we knew it was going to be bad when, uh, if Eric Adams were elected. Um, it felt like, and it has felt like, sort of a Trump situation where like we all were like, oh my God, given what he was saying um, leading up to his election, Trump is going to be horrible, ground earth shattering, and he was still so much worse than any of us could have imagined. That's how it felt when Eric Adams came into office. I try to go back to, to that like day. It was like the day after he was elected. The very first thing that this man, Eric Adams, the freedom fighter that he was kind of at, the civil rights leader he was, he was claiming to be during the campaign, his first act as mayor, do you remember what it was? He expanded solitary confinement on Rikers Island. After he expanded uh, uh, solitary confinement on Rikers and his new city council, the majority of them actually voted to reprimand him for doing that. He came out and publicly said, I'm not gonna listen to you city council because you have never been a police officer. Stating really clearly that the only opinions that actually matter when it comes to whether to lock someone up or not, the conditions of confinement, the torture of solitary confinement, the only things in that matter are those who made a living arresting people, controlling people, taking away people's freedom. But that's the precedent he set right out the gate. He's not a black mayor. He's not the hip hop mayor. He's NYPD's mayor. Eric Adams was a transit cop and NYPD captain for 22 years. But have you ever wondered how he became a police officer? When Eric Adams was just 14 years old, he was in a gang, believe it or not. He and his brother stole a TV set and a money order and were later arrested when Adams tried to cash that money order. Adams said that at the station, two white cops took the boys downstairs and began to beat them down, kicking them in their groin and testicle areas so that the injuries wouldn't show up. But that a black cop eventually looked into the room and told the officers, that's enough. They beat Eric Adams so bad that he said that he had blood in his urine for seven days and they sent him to juvie. Adams said that it made his brother develop a deep hatred for the cops but not him. He was drawn to the power. These white men had beat the brakes off them, two teenage boys, and Eric Adams said that he thought to himself, the cops had a great hustle. But that in particular, he said, he was enamored by the black cop, the power that the black cop had to be able to tell the white cops to stop was the closest thing Eric Adams said that he'd seen to a black man being the equal of white folks. And he liked that. He said that he decided right then that the black cop was more powerful than the black petty criminals he had admired, that they had more clout, more juice, as the kids would say. And he wanted to become a black policeman so he could get in on the quote, free drinks, the swagger, the respect, the fear. And that is a practice that we know Mixie Mayor Adams has taken full advantage of. That is why Eric Adams became a black cop. In his eyes, it was the closest he could get to being the equal of a white man. It was the most powerful he could become. It was how he could instill fear. He decided he would not be a criminal when he realized that as a black cop in his neighborhood, he could instill more fear, get more respect and more perks. This realization by Adams was his recognition that we live in a police state and he decided to buy in. It did not matter to him that the way that these officers were commanding respect and power was through abusing black men and boys just like himself. If he could be the black cop in the room, his takeaway was about power, not justice, not blackness, but power. Eric Adams does not care about police brutality, nor does he see being a police officer as a means of protecting black boys and men who are brutalized by the police. In March, 2022, NYPD officers claimed an 18 year old boy, Luis Manuel Monsanto, failed to stop for a traffic stop in the Bronx. So the officers chased the boy and opened fire on his vehicle, shooting him in the head, leaving him in critical condition. Officers are actually prohibited from opening fire on moving vehicles. So Eric Adams basically comes out as both a defense attorney and a judge for the police in the case and tells us that the police decision to open fire on the unarmed 18 year old boy in a traffic stop, despite that being expressly against NYPD policy, is justified because the vehicle itself was a weapon. And he and his infinite discernment as Eric Adams reviewed all the evidence and determined without a shadow of a doubt 
that this young boy was going to roll over the officers with his car. A claim that has never been substantiated. Video has never emerged evidencing this. No weapons were ever recovered from the boy's car and he was never charged for any criminal activity whatsoever. And in the day of days where vehicles are used in terrorist attacks to drive into cr crowds, this we di we're dealing with a different moment in policing and we we'll continue to train our police officers to deal with how now vehicles are used as uh, weapons to harm innocent people as well as police officers. So this was not a rolling back. This was not a backing up. This was a, a very clear uh, attempt to uh, drive at a police officer. Eric Adams really manages to position the police officers as under attack. And I find that especially ballsy of him to remind us that people are using vehicles in terroristic attacks to drive into crowds because it's always NYPD carrying out those attacks on protesters. <laughs> Eric Adams likes to dramatize the danger police face while dismissing the danger police pose to everyone else, even while he's being confronted with the evidence of their brutality. Because in reality, very few officers die in the line of duty. In 2021, there was a record high in officers being killed on the job, and that number was a whopping 73. Compare that to the 779 people police have already killed just this year, or the least 1,201 people police killed last year. But you wouldn't know that if you let Eric Adams tell it, because that wouldn't fit his narrative which is why he simply lies. Two NYPD officers were killed during Eric Adams' first month in office. And when I say Eric Adams said, baby, I'm gonna milk this shit, he milked that bitch like a cow, okay? Eric Adams came out and told us that the loss of those officers reminded him of his dear, dear fallen officer friend who died in the line of duty in 1987. So dear a friend, in fact, that Adams has never stopped thinking about Robert. So he carries his photo in his wallet with him for decades. And he pulled out that picture like the saint he is. Until his former aides came forward and told the media that Adams had instructed them to print that fucking picture off Google in black and white and to make it look worn in the wallet by spilling some goddamn coffee on it. What? What? This nigga is a menace and a showman. Despite how Eric Adams loves to invoke his impoverished upbringing to position himself as a working class man and his petty crime filled youth as a gang member trying to earn money to change his life circumstances, Adams offers little to no sympathy, grace, compassion, or even understanding of the boys and men who look like him and come from similar backgrounds and experiences. And he demonstrates that repeatedly in his criminalization of young black boys, especially those he in any way associates with hip hop. That is who the black cop is. That's what makes them particularly dangerous to the black community. Because as James Baldwin said, black policemen were another matter. We used to say, if you must call a policeman, for we hardly ever did, for God's sake, try to make sure it was a white one. A black policeman could completely demolish you. He knew far more about you than a white policeman could, and you were without defenses. Before this black brother in uniform, whose entire reason for breathing seemed to be to offer his proof that he was black, but he was not black like you. Which is why it shouldn't surprise anyone that despite using that police brutality story to appeal to black voters as someone who understood the issues with police brutality in a police state, Eric Adams is a big, don't talk to me about police brutality or black lives matter when there's black on black crime guy. In fact, Eric Adams thinks that the problem with white liberals is that they're too scared to talk about the real problem, black on black crime. <laughs> Quote, you can't say black lives matter and have outrage when a police officer shoots someone, but ignore shootings in our city the same day when 15 people are shot. That's Eric Adams. And it's interesting to me that he wants to dismiss the relevance of race in police brutality and act like black people are just making it about race, despite the fact that black people are three times more likely than white people to be killed by the police. But when that 84 year old white woman asked Eric Adams a question about the rent guidelines board at a town hall meeting, Eric Adams told old girl she was treating him like she was a plantation owner. Okay, first, if you're gonna ask a question, don't point at me and don't be disrespectful to me. I'm the mayor of this city and treat me with the respect that I, would, I deserve to be treated. I'm speaking to you as an adult, 
Don't stand in front like you treated someone that's on the plantation that you own. Give me the respect I deserve and engage in the conversation. Up here in Washington Heights, treat me with the same level of respect I treat you. So don't be pointing at me. Don't be disrespectful to me. Speak with me as an adult because I'm a grown man. I walked into this room as a grown man, and I'm going to walk out of this room as a grown man. I answered your question. And his response might seem disproportionate to the unknowing heir, but everything he's saying is very consistent with why he told us he became a cop. Respect power and fair. He will not be challenged by that lady or anybody else, which is the reason he won't acquiesce to a Rikers receivership. But more on that later. But back to his black on black crime comments. Think back to the rules of racial standing we discussed earlier. A black man willing to parrot a racist white talking point at the detriment of the black community so that white people can strip the sentiment of its obvious anti-blackness by pretending a black person can't be racist. By pretending a black person can't be anti-black. They're keeping it real. They're abandoning groupthink. Mind you, the black on black crime myth has been debunked a million times. Quote, a report released by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2017 found that of all the violent crime committed between 2012 and 2015, 22.7% of the crime was committed by black people and 63% of those were committed against other black people. This is in comparison to 44% of all violent crime committed by white people, 57% of which were committed against other white people. According to the data, white people commit crimes against other white people at about the same rate that black people do against other black people. But despite these numbers, you don't hear about white on white crime. When a white person commits a crime against another white person, it's just called crime. Race isn't a factor and that's intentional. Using language like black on black crime perpetuates the myth that interracial violence is specific to the black community. A myth that implies black people are inherently more violent, end quote. And thus, the problem is internal and not systemic. And while I'm on the topic of Eric Adams parroting back racist talking points to legitimize them, look no further than this attack on drill music. And we are going to pull together the social media companies and sit down with them and state that you have a civic and corporate responsibility. So politicians trying to cancel rap seems quite familiar. We've seen this before. We've heard this song before. Tonight, my guest talked the mayor's proposal. We start with legendary rapper Willie D of the Ghetto Boys. Like, instead of a lot of these politicians, like, talking to the youth, they like to come at the youth. The youth in hip-hop since its inception has always been the low-hanging fruit. So... They like to attack hip hop because they feel like they can get some easy points. You know, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't respect the kids' opinion. They don't respect the youths. Uh, they don't respect their their feelings, their pain. They don't respect uh, their music. But they want. But then they say the kids are so disrespectful. The, this gen the generation is lost. Well, if they're lost, who lost them? The generation before them. And it's people just like him who is a bigger problem instead of like talking at the youth. He's making the same mistake that people like C. Dolores Tucker made, you know, when in the 90s with, with hip hop reality, reality rap. It's the same thing. It's the same. He's, he's reading from the same playbook for some of those voters out there that are older. When they hear, oh, yeah, it's the youth, it's the youngsters, it's the music, get them. Instead of going after the cause instead of looking at the cause why are these young kids out here making this type of music and you know and why and why is it that they even have a fan base in the first place it's got to be something there so why not why not go deeper and try to you know and, and try to remedy the cause as opposed to the reaction eric adams even managed to make george floyd about black on black crime he said quote we must be holistic when we are talking about the George Floyd case, don't mix it up. Police reform has nothing to do with the violence in our community. But when we are talking about the Floyd case, we should also be talking about the violence that we are seeing in Chicago. A hundred people shot in Chicago over the July 4th weekend. What the actual fuck do shootings in Chicago have to do with police officers kneeling on George Floyd's neck until he died in Minneapolis? What the fuck does that have to do with black on black crime? He even threw in a little quote. If I get killed on the job, the odds are it will be a black person pulling the trigger, end quote. 
So considering how he feels about black people and black on black crime, it shouldn't surprise you that Eric Adams brought back stop and frisk, which you know was found unconstitutional. So Adams is taken to calling it stop question and frisk. About this word that under Mayor Adams, the NYPD has stopped tens of thousands of pedestrians, citing vague reasons like, quote, fit relevant description and quote, other. Just 5% were white, a starker racial disparity than during the height of stop and frisk under Bloomberg. That's what people should be paying attention to. It's not just like Eric Adams is bad. He's the worst mayor for health and safety, truth and justice in the history of the city. It was one of the most controversial things the NYPD ever did. The policy known as stop and frisk, it was supposed to be essentially ended. That's because uh, nearly all the stops and frisks by cops involved people of color. But now the practice has returned and the NYPD and the mayor say crime is down partly because of it. The federal monitor writes, the results are disappointing. Too many people are stopped, frisked, and searched unlawfully. At the precinct level, commanding officers fail to identify and correct the unconstitutional policing. And the department's oversight is inadequate at all levels. So when the monitor writes her report, we should also talk about how many of the almost 10,000 illegal guns we removed off our streets. Fact check. NYPD's anti-crime unit's use of stop and frisk is notoriously racist and violent. In 2011, nearly 700,000 New Yorkers were stopped and frisked. 90% of them were people of color and only 2% of them were actually found in possession of any unlawful items. That's why it was ruled unconstitutional in 2013. And the court also created a position for a federal monitor to oversee NYPD's anti-crime units that had employed the tactic because of their history of targeting black and Hispanic people. The units were responsible for so much disproportionate police shootings of black and brown people that the units were disbanded in 2020. But you know who brought them back? Fuck ass Eric Adams. Despite Eric Adams' insistence that the anti-crime units would just suddenly not be racist in their use of stop and frisk under his tenure, and that they're finding all these illegal guns and drugs, the Federal Monitor reported that, quote, almost all of the stops made by the rebranded neighborhood safety teams analyzed in the report, 97% were of Black and Hispanic people, and 24% of the stops were unconstitutional. Of 230 car stops included in the sample, only two have appeared to turn up weapons. The study found especially troubling numbers in a handful of precincts, including the 41st precinct in the Bronx, where only 41% of the stops, 32% of the frisks, and 26% of the searches were constitutional, according to the report. And just another word on NYPD's anti-crime units that Eric Adams brought back. Do you know where those units originated from? They originated from NYPD's street crime unit, a unit that had been disbanded in 2001 after a long history of violence and killings of black and brown New Yorkers. The anti-crime units had grown out of NYPD street crime units that killed Amadou Diallo in 1999, an unarmed black man who they shot 41 times. Now that you know about stop and frisk, you should understand his commitment to invading the privacy and policing black and brown New Yorkers. So it shouldn't shock you that he's not only embracing NYPD using drones to generally spy on New Yorkers, but he explicitly announced the use of drones in relation to backyard parties. In other words, on top of flooding black and brown neighborhoods with police, he's now using drones to police and spy on black and brown New Yorkers without probable cause or even reasonable suspicion of any crime, just that we are black. That is happening. Eric Adams is nobody's progressive. In fact, Eric Adams perceives your average white liberal as a radical extremist, so that should really tell you something. He spoke at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in 2022 as a communications expert at the request of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Representative Patrick Maloney, where he vocally rebuked progressives, activists, and anyone supporting defunding the police and, quote, attacking corporations. But this stance is consistent with the Eric Adams who asserted in 2021 that the true threat to America are the democratic socialists. And that in his race for mayor, he was running against a movement, the democratic socialist movement. And in May of this year, 
He gave a memorial speech where he goes full on Republican, okay? Denouncing socialism and communism, not fascism, mind you, just socialism and communism, which he blamed for, quote, the destruction playing out across the globe. And then he insisted the problem with young Americans was that they aren't patriotic enough and should be being forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Now that I think you understand who Eric Adams is, let's talk about what he's actually done as mayor so you understand why New Yorkers hate him. I wanted to cover Eric Adams' war on the homeless, his recent attack on migrants, and his mishandling of the Rikers crisis separately because he's done enough damage in each individual area to warrant their own sections. But it's all tied together because these populations overlap because he's criminalizing all of them. In other words, how Eric Adams is treating and policing black and brown New Yorkers, unhoused New Yorkers, migrants seeking asylum, and the people incarcerated at Rikers are all intertwined because it's his treatment of each of those groups that's landing them in Rikers. So consider this a big chapter with a bunch of sub chapters. So let's zoom out and start from the top. The, the, the decisions that he, he makes, it's not only the messages, the things that he talks about in order to say, to do the things. The, the number of people locked up in pre, uh, pretrial on Rikers Island has gone through the roof. He's reversed a de Blasio era change in transparency and refused to let the media know about folks that have died on Rikers and 27 people have under his watch. Uh, he's thrown all the money and even more at the world's richest and most costly and wasteful police force in the history of the world um, and given the back pay at the expense of other things like education, libraries, uh, and, and, and health care. But it's also been how he's talked about the issue and, and who has been listening. And I think that's in some ways, or at least at least as bad as the treatment of the people who he's claiming to represent. The way that he's lying uh, to New York City, folks in New York City, to New Yorkers, to the rest of the country about health and safety, about bail reform, about uh, policing, isn't just, I don't know, scaring people in the present, but it's changing policy. It's also it's losing Democrats' elections. To get a thorough overview of Eric Adams' administration and his handling or mishandling of the issues New Yorkers face, let's zoom out and start with the budget cuts that were bad last year and worse this year. Before we address his war on the homeless, and his exacerbation of the Rikers crisis individually and in depth. Because Eric Adams may be staunchly against defunding the police, but he's not against defunding absolutely everything else. The NYPD is the biggest and most expensive police department in the entire country. NYPD is given more money and employs more police than any department in the entire country. In the entire country. And it gets a third bigger each and every single year since 2010. Please remember that when people, namely Eric Adams, are trying to paint New York City as Gotham and blaming it on the absence of police and talking all that law and order bullshit. No place is a greater representation of the investment and continued failure of law and order than New York City. New York City spends more money policing niggas, and I do mean niggas than anywhere else. So if it's lawless around this bitch, perhaps it's time he tries some new shit, like giving people the resources they need for housing, mental health, healthcare, and education. Maybe. But you know who does not believe that shit? Fuck ass Eric Adams. Because he continues to defund all that shit while continuing to find more and more money for NYPD. In 2020, when Eric Adams first began crying that defunding the police was the great, great danger we're all facing, over $11 billion was being given to the NYPD. That amount has not only not decreased, it's increased each year since, as well as the amount of employed officers. Despite crime being at an all-time low, over 85% of all summons police issue are to black or brown New Yorkers. And over 90% of all people incarcerated at Rikers are black or brown New Yorkers. Last year, Adams proposed a $615 million budget cut to the Department of Homeless Services, a $215 million cut to education that ended up being a net cut of $469 million, and cuts to parks. 
This included teacher layoffs, loss of art programs, closures of pools. But while laying off teachers, he proposed a $200 million increase to NYPD's massive budget and an additional $90 million for pay raises. This year, Eric Adams' budget cuts were not only steep, but if you ever had any doubt the kind of inhumanity they were based in, listen to this disgusting, xenophobic rant he did indistinguishable from something you'd expect to hear from Texas Governor Greg Abbott, saying migrants are going to destroy New York City. And that's why he's decided to gut funding for social services while continuing to line the NYPD's pockets. The same shit he was doing last year without this crisis. Take careful note of the countries he chooses to name when invoking this hysteria that migrants will ruin the city, that they're coming to your neighborhood, the dog whistles might miss you coming from a black man, but if you close your eyes and just listen, trust that it's deafening. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. We're getting 10,000 migrants a month. One time we were just in Venezuela. Now we're in Ecuador. Now we're getting Russian speaking coming th through Mexico. Now we're getting uh, Western Africa. Now we're getting people from all over the globe have made their minds up that they're gonna come through the southern part of the border and come into New York City. And everyone is saying it's New York City's problem. Every community in this city is going to be impacted. We got a $12 billion deficit that we're going to have to cut. Every service in this city is going to be impacted, all of us. And so I say to you, as I turn it over to you, this is some, some of the most educated, some of the most knowledgeable, probably more of my commissioners and deputy commissioners and chiefs live in this community. So as you ask me a question about migrants, tell me what role you played. How many of you organized to stop what they're doing to us? How many of you were part of the movement to say, we're seeing what this mayor is trying to do and they're destroying New York City. It's gonna to come to your neighborhoods. All of us are gonna be impacted by this. I said it last year when we had 15,000, and I'm telling you now with 110,000, the city we knew, we're about to lose. The only thing I'm going to add to this, it is legal to seek asylum in this country. That is a right. Asylum seekers are not doing anything illegal or wrong, nor is the Adams administration supporting them like he purports to be. He is using them to further his own agenda in the press and to justify cuts he was already going to make, that he always makes. And once we discuss Adams' treatment of homeless New Yorkers, you won't believe for a second that he was trying to help the migrants. This bus terminal became the first welcome sign for migrants after hours long journeys from Texas. But the mayor says to his frustration, they are still arriving by the bus load. Power Malu was there when the first buses of migrants arrived. We are on the ground. We've outlasted every city agency that has come in to the Port Authority, which is a disgrace. A year later, he says the city's resources have been mismanaged and the responsibility now falling onto organizers like him. Several months ago, we saw the city here with representatives welcoming the migrants with open arms, providing resources. At what point did you see that change? So unfortunately, the migrants have been used as political pawns since day one which is why you had so many city agencies and politicians popping their head in because it was really popular. It was a way for them to show that they actually cared, but there was no real follow through. Hotels like the historic Roosevelt became intake shelters for migrants. The city says they quickly filled up and the issue became a blame game between the mayor and local aid groups. They're not looking at the migrants as human beings. They're looking at them as numbers. They're looking at them as a way to get more money from the federal government. And they're also using them for their own tactic, which is to deter more people from coming here to New York City. Out of the more than 110,000 who have arrived, many of them are families. First day jitters for the nearly 20,000 newly arrived children entering classrooms all across the city. Nervios, pues. It is the story of New York City. We don't treat people as outsiders. We welcome them with open arms. Adams is using asylum seekers to hide behind the steep budget cuts he's just proposed to everything but the police. The police union, the Police Benevolent Association, a multi-year $5.5 billion deal. And Eric Adams was 
too proud to announce this historic agreement with the PBA. Just look at him. Is it given the penny pension that he was just giving us when he was talking about the asylum seekers? Oh, oh okay. Uh, today, we are very excited uh, to make an important announcement with our partners at the PBA. And to do that, I'd now like to introduce Mayor Adams. Today, we're making it clear that New York City will support the men and women of the NYPD as they do one of the toughest jobs anywhere. We are here to announce a new deal with the Police Benevolent Association that would do just that. This is a, is a historic deal, only the third voluntary contract with the PBA in 30 years, one that would make sure our officers get the benefits and compensation they deserve, allow them to work a more flexible schedule, build morale going forward and ensure that New York remains the safest big city in America. And I want to thank our team, uh, Brendan and Renee, uh, Jock and his team and their teams. For the last few months, we have been in conversation, working throughout the weekends, coming to the table repeatedly. This nigga was laying off teachers without remorse last year. He's looking to make cuts to public libraries that would close many branches and city agencies like fire, sanitation, parks and homeless services. But he wouldn't dream the police don't get bonuses because he's the police. Listen to him. Listen to the way he thanks Pat, the PBA president, for lobbying on behalf of the police. Because as he tells us, Pat is his friend. And then I want to thank... Uh, Pat, the person that I've known for many years, and he stood firm and tall to make sure he could deliver for his members. Ask yourself, when in your motherfucking life have you ever seen management or the powers that be thank the union for fighting them for their benefits and what they deserve? Not fucking never, but you're seeing it here. Because the police union not fighting Adams. They the goddamn police. They're not fighting anyone in a police state. That's why they get, get, get. While teachers get layoffs and education gets so many budget cuts that even the high school students themselves start protesting it. Students, parents, and teachers found last year's budget cuts were just too hard to swallow. And now some students are taking a proactive approach this morning to change what they say went wrong last year so they can make sure their education resources are available to them moving forward in the next year to come and for years to come. They don't want to see any more of these cuts, so they are taking a stand and they want their voices heard. A group of students organizing a walkout and rally at City Hall today protesting last year's $469 million in funding cuts. Over the summer, Mayor Eric Adams and the City Department of Education ordered the budget cuts to avoid a shortfall. An appeals court ruled the DOE could go ahead with the funding cuts, but the ruling also found the city did not follow state procedures when it approved the education budget. This could mean changes to how future city budgets are passed. And Eric Adams has been confronted directly about the high school students protesting his budget cuts to education. First of all, uh, having high school, as a person who has participated in protests throughout my life, seeing our young children involved in civic engagement warms my heart. Just do it on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> I would like for them to be in school. But having them engage, having them analyzing the budget, I'm going to go to that school and I'm going to um, give them an analysis of our budget. We want this civic engagement with our students. I think it's commendable that they are getting involved in these important issues. And they too, uh, I would like for them to do a letter writing campaign to the federal government and say we need to be treating New York City fairly around the money that we are putting into the asylum seekers and we should get our fair share of tax dollars back to the city. And so I would like for them to stay engaged and I'm really pleased that they were out. I heard them from my room of, you know, talking about this issue. We know we're doing the right thing around education. Jock will break that down uh, when, he do, when he does his analysis. And we listened to uh, Councilwoman uh, Rita Joseph 
came up with some good ideas, and we believe we've done some great things around education. We'll continue to do so. But hooray for those students, but just do it on the weekend. Adam takes the opportunity to not only blame the asylum seekers, as though he didn't cut $469 million from education just last year, before he was even bemoaning this migrant crisis, but to pretend he thoughtfully engaged these students in their questions, or that he's proud of their civic engagement. Adams makes two more noteworthy horrific budget cuts. One pertaining to Rikers that I'll discuss a little later in that section, and the other, well, the other he decided mattered so much, he used his very special veto power for the second time ever. The first time he used his veto power was in January 2022 to oppose increasing penalties for zoning violations. But do you want to know what he opposed so much he had to veto it? You must remove the cancer. Mayor Adams going head to head with some members of the city council. Yeah, this comes after he voted, uh, vetoed a number of bills that would have expanded eligibility for affordable housing in the city. You don't see the tents, you don't see the cardboard boxes. When they are identified, we immediately move to rectify the situation. Mayor Adams defending his administration's efforts to help homeless people get off New York City streets and subways. Our city is not a city where people who are in need of care should be living on the streets where they don't get that care. The mayor's remarks coming on the same day he vetoed a number of bills passed by city council that address the city's affordable housing crisis. The council's package of bills allow more people to qualify for the city's housing voucher program. The program subsidizes rent to help homeless New Yorkers move from shelters into permanent housing. It would also assist those facing eviction. City Council member Perina Sanchez represents the Bronx. It was legislation that would have increased access to housing vouchers for New Yorkers who are struggling with eviction and that would have moved people who are in shelters into permanent uh, housing faster. Mayor Adams says what the City Council wants would simply be too expensive, adding, quote, it's a structure that could saddle taxpayers with billions of dollars in costs each year. This legislation also clearly exceeds the council's legal authority. City Council Member Sanchez disagrees. She says council has the votes to override the mayor's veto. It is much more expensive to keep a family in a shelter than it is to keep them in an apartment. This showdown between the mayor and city council comes at a time when the shelter system is stretched to its limits. Thousands of asylum seekers continue to arrive in the city each week, straining the city's resources. Well, the timing of this tension, not ideal for the ongoing budget talks. The mayor and city council must agree on a new spending plan by July 1st. The city council on the other issue of housing vouchers has 30 days to come up with the votes to override the mayor's veto. This is the same motherfucker throwing homeless people out the subways, tearing up their encampments on the streets, cutting money from the Department of Homeless Services, and now he vetoes the bills that would give people vouchers for housing. Eric Adams wants homeless people in Rikers, point blank, period. And that is not hyperbole. Ask yourself, where else could he possibly expect they go? Bet better yet, ask yourself, where does it seem like he wants them to go, hmm? He don't want them in the housing, hotels, the subways, or the streets. So where? And override it, the New York City Council members did. But that was just one of Eric Adams' many acts in what can only be described as his war against homeless people. There is no truly accurate measurement of the amount of homeless people living in New York City. But as of June 2023, according to the Coalition of the Homeless, there are over 84,526 homeless people, including 27,530 homeless children sleeping each night in New York City's main municipal city shelters. A near record 25,061 single adults slept in shelters each night in June of 2023. That's just who's in the shelters, not on the streets or in Rikers. The vast majority of homeless New Yorkers in the shelter system are black and brown, are suffering from mental illness, severe health problems, or at least one disability. The research shows that the primary cause of homelessness for New Yorkers is lack of affordable housing, eviction, doubled up or severely overcrowded housing, 
domestic violence, job loss, and hazardous housing conditions. And yet, Eric Adams has chosen to do the exact opposite of addressing the causes of homelessness by instead criminalizing the homeless, vetoing their opportunities for housing, cutting the budget for the Department of Homeless Services, and is now looking to suspend New York City's right to shelter laws altogether under the guise of being overwhelmed by the migrant crisis. In this morning, Mayor Adams is facing pushback from advocates for the homeless after taking action to modify the city's long-standing right to shelter policy. The court order was put in place in the 80s, granting people a safe place to sleep. It comes as the mayor says the city's been overwhelmed by more than 70,000 and asylum seekers over the last mayor Eric Adams saying he is not looking to end the right to shelter but he does want a judge to suspend it until they get a bit better grasp on the situation now many are arguing though that this has been a lifeline for countless New Yorkers seeking shelter and critical services and it should not be touched it's being called a humanitarian crisis. New York City dealing with a sizable influx of asylum seekers. Now the mayor alleging it's reaching an uncontrollable level, that New York legacy laws should be altered. Just yesterday, he filed this application, requesting the city no longer be required to comply with a four-decade-old court order, which mandates this city provide shelter to anyone who requests it. Adams actually began his term as mayor by invoking the wildest hysteria and propaganda around homeless people causing crime on the subways. And then he added a thousand more cops to the New York City subways to force homeless people out and back onto the street. We start tonight with subway safety. Mayor Adams unveiled an aggressive plan to remove all homeless people. The problem of the homeless on the subways, sleeping on trains, urinating on platforms, bringing shopping carts of belongings, have bedeviled mayors for decades. But Mayor Adams, former transit captain Eric Adams, is just not going to put up with it anymore. He's sending his cops and teams of outreach workers to remove them ASAP. The subway plan is a comprehensive civic strategy that will do more than deal with a temporary fix. You can't put a band-aid on a cancerous sore. That is not how you solve the problem. You must remove the cancer and start the healing process. Adam said he will start by requiring the police to strictly enforce transit rules, such as sleeping across multiple seats, exhibiting aggressive behavior, and creating an unsanitary environment. Cops will also demand that the homeless leave the train at the end of the line because... We got so used to being dysfunctional that it became the normality. Well, I'm not a dysfunctional mayor, and I don't pretend that a problem doesn't exist. It's troubling that a mayor in uh, such a large city would use terms like disgusting or cancer to refer to his homeless constituents. Um, these, are pe these are human beings who deserve care and respect and dignity. An especially sick part to this sick-ass plan was Eric Adams' plan to hospitalize homeless people for mental illness against their will. In a dramatic move, Mayor Adams has directed police, EMS, and crisis teams to hospitalize more people with mental illness who are sleeping on the streets and subways, whether they like it or not. CBS 2's Ali Bauman has reaction. Adams says the city has a moral obligation to get them help, but some advocates argue that the plan addresses symptoms of homelessness without treating the root causes. Ramel Rich has been living on the streets in Greenwich Village for a few months now. I'm not mentally ill. I just have big issues. We asked him about the mayor's homeless outreach plan. I feel that's bad because a lot of hospitals and agencies are in force. They're against us. Um, people who have mental ill issues, you can't stop that. Hospitals aren't the answer. Mayor Adams is now directing first responders and outreach workers to transport people experiencing a mental health crisis to a hospital if they are a danger to themselves or unable to meet their basic needs. Adams insists state law gives him this authority. We believe this is the first time that a mayoral administration had give, has given this direction on the basic needs standard and official guidance. The city will set up a teleconsult hotline, which first responders can use to show a clinical expert the person they're dealing with in real time. From there, teams decide whether to bring them in for a full psych eval. When that full evaluation happens, the psychiatrist may conclude, this is not someone with mental illness, this is somebody who is on drugs. Different issue, doesn't, isn't part of the mental health law. The New York Civil Liberties Union, though, likens Adams' plan to the policies of former Mayor Rudy Giuliani. 
acting as if you can sweep a problem out of public view, right, and it'll go away. Well, it doesn't go away. Um, it doesn't provide the treatment that's necessary for a long-term solution, and it causes great harm to individuals who are themselves hurting quite a bit. Some advocates argue City Hall should instead focus its efforts on permanent housing. Where will they be discharged to after they're done with the period of hospitalization or evaluation? While the Legal Aid Society applauds the mayor for addressing the mental health crisis, attorney Jeffrey Berman says the plan does not address the revolving door of prison. The people that the, the, the mayor Adams is speaking about um, often get arrested. Are we going to divert them into meaningful, robust community treatment so that they never ever get arrested again and so that they never have to go to a psychiatric emergency room. And no, the plan was and absolutely is not to keep homeless and mentally ill people from being churned in and out of Rikers. But we'll get to Rikers soon. Once successfully forced back onto the streets, Adams began tearing down the encampments homeless people live in all over the city, throwing them out with all of their belongings with absolutely no regard to placing them in housing, as well as arresting them and advocates. There is pushback this morning against Mayor Adams' sweep of homeless encampments across the city. Some are upset after the city crews forcibly removed an encampment in the East Village yesterday. It led to a standoff and several arrests. CBS News' John Diaz joins us live from City Hall with more. John. Chris Emanuel, seven hours. That's how long these homeless people and their advocates stood resolute. But in the end, though, Mayor Eric Adams coming out the victor. He won, you know, his efforts clearing out another homeless encampment. What started off as an hours long standoff ended with seven people arrested for refusing to leave a homeless encampment in the East Village. No, it's not fair. No, it's not fair. Amid the cold and rain, the unhoused New Yorkers and several advocates defiantly stood their ground against New York City police and sanitation workers before they then swiftly removed the tents these people once called home. Cynthia V says it's an affordable housing issue. If you're living from paycheck to paycheck, you're one family problem, one illness, one crisis away from being in the tent next to mine. <laughs> but what we need to understand is, Eric Adams don't give a fuck about none of that shit. And nothing really demonstrates the true depth to how little humanity Eric Adams has for black and brown people, the unhoused, the mentally ill, the marginalized, than in his treatment of the people at Rikers. We are finally to the final major section, the personal thorn in my side as it pertains to Eric Adams, and that's Rikers. I would just like to take a moment to scream. All right, I'm going to give you, or I'm going to try to give you, a comprehensive overview of the Rikers crisis, the plan to close Rikers, and everything Eric Adams is doing to exacerbate the crisis and prove to me that he is a demon straight from hell. Rikers is New York City's infamous pretrial detention center, where black and brown New Yorkers have been terrorized since 1932. A lesser known fact is that over 85% of the people there have not been convicted of a crime. They many times simply do not have the money to purchase their freedom to fight their case from the outside. The jail has been notorious for human rights abuses for decades and is considered a humanitarian crisis. Despite a widely popular campaign to close Rikers, especially after the death of Khalif Browder, a 16-year-old who was wrongly accused of stealing a backpack and sent to Rikers for two years where he spent the majority of his time in solitary confinement before he was released and eventually took his own life. No substantive steps have been made to close the jail. In fact, as we discussed earlier, Eric Adams has continued the use of solitary confinement despite the opposition of the council members and instead taken to calling it restrictive housing and punitive segregation. And New York continues to spend $860 million on the jail each year. People die at Rikers awaiting trial each and every single year. As a result, Rikers has been overseen by a federal monitor who reports to federal judge T. Swain since 2014 as a part of a class action settlement. Federal Monitor has held Rikers in contempt 
repeatedly. Federal Monitor's job was to muscle New York City into getting the situation under control, but Rikers has demonstrably failed to comply with every new report and mandate from the Monitor. So the Monitor, along with Damian Williams, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, have also called for a receivership, insisting that Rikers is no better off than it was eight years ago and that the city should be held in contempt for failure to combat the escalating violence. In 2021, 16 people died in Rikers, making it the then highest death toll since 2013. That was until Eric Adams became mayor. A record 27 people have died in Rikers since he became mayor. Of the seven deaths to occur this year, staff were disciplined in five of the seven for fault, which involved things like security lapses, like unlocked doors and lack supervision. If you're wondering why you hadn't heard about that, it's because Eric Adams quite literally made sure you didn't. In May, the Department of Corrections announced that they were no longer going to notify the media and the public of in-custody deaths. Adams' administration decided that instead of continuing to field negative backlash and public outrage to the mounting deaths at Rikers while still refusing to admit that he cannot handle the problem, he would simply stop telling the public about it. You can't be outraged about what you don't know about. The Department of Corrections didn't even bother to make this announcement until the media discovered that they'd failed to notify the public of at least two deaths, including those of Rubu Zhao, 52-year-old who died after he allegedly jumped from an upper tier of a specialized unit on Rikers for people with mental illness on May 14th, and of Joshua Valles, 31 years old, who died this year after suffering from a fractured skull that officials first internally labeled as a heart attack. If it's striking you as suspicious how officials say someone died of a heart attack and it turns out they had a fractured skull, it should. And we're going to get to the cover-ups of deaths at Rikers shortly. When asked to explain this sudden decision to stop notifying the public and the media of in-custody deaths, the Adams administration response was simply that it was a practice from the de Blasio administration that they chose to do, not a policy. So they just not gonna do it no more, child. This kind of attempt to keep the public in the dark via Rikers is very consistent for Eric Adams' administration, which has also blocked the Board of Correction, which is supposed to oversee the Department of Corrections, from having access to real-time video surveillance on Rikers and other city jails. Adams has been attempting to conceal Rikers' abuse and stop change from the inside from day one of his administration when he hired Commissioner Molina, who immediately fired the head of internal affairs and staff discipline Serena Townsend when she refused to dismiss 2,000 complaints against corrections officers, which is why I called her up so she could really break it down to us directly. Um, so my name is Serena Townsend. I am a criminal defense attorney. And prior to my being a criminal defense attorney, I worked as the deputy commissioner of the investigation and trials division on Rikers Island. Um, I did that for about five and a half years. And what that means is I was the person in charge of all of the investigations into Rikers staff misconduct, and then the attempt at holding those people accountable for their misconduct. Um, so yes, I had, not only did I have an insider's view of Rikers Island by working at the Department of Correction, but I had the insider's insider's view. I ha had the ability to kind of investigate everything that was going on there um, from staff sleeping on post to um, sexual abuse on Rikers Island to everything in between, um, particularly excessive use of force, things like that. You know, I think the overarching uh, issue that we're seeing right now is Rikers Island, although it's always been a hellhole. It's always been problematic. The culture of Rikers Island is toxic. What you're seeing with Mayor Adams is kind of an exponentially bad situation because of the fact that he's sending more people there uh, than previous mayors have in the past, previous police commissioners, etc. He's claiming that because there's so many people on Rikers Island and because crime is so bad, he certainly can't close Rikers or improve it. Uh, and then, of course, the issue of transparency. He is systematically, along with obviously the commissioner that he hired, Commissioner Louis Molina, they have been since day one systematically closing all of the doors of transparency, making sure that nobody knows what's going on there. Um, and fudging, you know, different statistics and numbers to make it seem like things are improving when they're actually not. 
essentially since day one, the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Molina has wanted to run things the way that he wants to run them. Um, and unfortunately, the way that he wants to run it is with a lot of yes men around him uh, and a lot of opacity. So on day one, he fired me. Um, I was, yeah. So, you know, maybe I'm a bit biased, but um, I had been bringing the department into compliance with um, investigations of misconduct. The unions didn't really like that because what that meant was I was working hand in hand with a federal monitor who was overseeing the excessive use of force on Rikers Island. Um, and we were partnering to try to make the investigations into those excessive use of force allegations more efficient, more fair, increase accountability and transparency. And I was doing just that, which pissed off the unions. Um, Commissioner Molina, uh, alongside Mayor Adams, wanted to make nice with the police unions, make nice with the correction officers, benevolent association, also known as COBA, and the captain's union. And they served my head up on a silver platter as kind of an offering on day one, which made the unions very happy. Um, and so with my firing, there really was no accountability over the misconduct that was happening. He didn't even have a replacement lined up for me, um, which just goes to show how much he thought of accountability for his department. He didn't even have somebody to run the place once he fired me. Um, but it's not just about me at all. That was just the first step in shrouding the entire place. So after firing me, he has taken a lot of steps to make sure that the public is not aware of what's going on on Rikers Island. One of the most um, effective oversight agencies that has been there for quite some time is the Board of Correction. And the Board of Correction, like my division, always had access to all the surveillance cameras on Rikers Island in real time. So honestly, the only way you could really know what's going on on Rikers Island in a quick, efficient way so that you could fix problems and know what's going on. Um, Molina has cut their access, cut the oversight board's access, um, which is really alarming and and frankly, it's strange that somebody would be able to cut the access of their own oversight agency. Like you would think that the power continuum goes the opposite direction, <laughs> you know, that the board would be able to say to Molina what he should or should not be doing. Not that Molina should be able to kind of take the access away right, from his own oversight. oversight. Right. It's really strange, um, but it nobody has done anything really to um, to fix that, except that the board has recently uh, filed a lawsuit against the city and against Molina himself personally for taking away that access and that litigation is pending. So that's something uh, that the commissioner has done to keep the public uninformed. What else has he done? He stopped communicating with the federal monitor, which is a big no-no. That's, no that's the main oversight um, entity that exists right now. Uh, and that is really, really bad. And that is not how things were before he took the helm of the department. Uh, he also told the press that he was going to stop reporting deaths in custody to the media, which I know is something you knew about, what you got very upset about just as I did. And you've been trying to publicize that horrific decision, just like I have. It's just, as you said, the public already doesn't know that much about what goes on on Rikers Island. But the right. few avenues that have existed in the past to allow the public that knowledge have now been yeah. cut off. Yeah. And Eric Adams has gone in particular. It was funny because de Blasio was always, you know, complacent and always felt like scared and like these people run him. But Eric Adams goes out of his way to empower them. Like the amount of <laughs> it, like between, you know, these cover ups, essentially these cover ups that you might be asking yourself, what cover ups am I referring to? Well, Last year, video footage emerged of three corrections officers standing and watching Michael Neves, a man incarcerated in Riker's mental health unit, bleed to death for 10 minutes after slitting his throat with a razor blade he'd been given. Shortly after, a corrections officer placed Kevin Bryan inside of a staff bathroom where he hung himself from a pipe. After that, Herman Diaz choked to death on an orange while other incarcerated people unsuccessfully begged officers to intervene and they did not. Three months after that, Antonio Bradley hung himself in a holding cell. 
but Adam chose not to inform the U.S. Department of Justice of the in-custody death, preventing the federal government from sending someone down to launch an investigation until much later. When questioned about the cover-up, Adam's response was, I don't see that as a cover-up or a violation of any rule. If it is, we will definitely correct it, but my understanding is that the place of death is a place where they died. Uh, him going to, to Rikers to basically, you know, support the corrections officers. I, um, I feel like that has been, that has been different. What do you, what do you think of like Eric Adams response to the deaths at Rikers? Yeah. Um, it's so interesting. You're right. Um, there's been an obvious standing together with the unions. In fact, when mayor Adams announced that commissioner Molina was his pick right before taking office, he stood up there with the correction captains and correction union uh, presidents, which yeah. I've never seen before. Um, and he even said, oh, I want my people with me referencing the union presidents, which is very different from what we've seen in the past. Uh, we are, we are, oh, let me, let me see what's going on to the left of me. Hold on. What are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? Huh? What are we doing? Because I want my, I want my unions here with me. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we're partners here. One thing you're going to find, folks, that there's one set of hands on the steering wheel of this city right now, and they're mine. I'm the leader. I'm the mayor. I'm going to make the determinations, and I'm going to make the audibles. Um, Eric Adams' response to the deaths in custody has been so offensive and so alarming because he even said uh, about a year ago, when he was criticized for the amount of deaths in custody, he said, well, let's find out why they died. Why did these people die? Because they're coming to Rikers Island with pre-existing conditions. And he spoke way too soon because we did find out why those people died. And most of the time, those people died because of staff misconduct, because they're not staffing posts correctly and they're lying about that because of the fact that officers are not touring appropriately, because of the fact that drugs are getting into Rikers Island from God knows where, but certainly through staff, visitors, et cetera, um, and nothing's being done about it. You will see over and over and over again, if anyone was allowed access to videos anymore, that uh, detainees are smoking all of the time. They're taking drugs all of the time in front of officers and the officers are not doing anything. And when you hear the numbers of deaths from overdoses and suicides, then you have to turn to Mayor Adams and say, that's why they're dying. You're an asshole. You cannot get up there ignorant and say, let's look at why they're dying because they have a pre uh, a precondition. Uh, and then that's actually not what's happening. So why is Rikers still open? In 2019, the campaign to close Rikers emerged and advocates introduced a plan to shut it down by reducing the jail's population to 3,300 and closing the additional rundown city jails, committing the same abuses against the people within it. Adams promised that if elected, he would support former Mayor Bill de Blasio's plan to close the jail altogether and to create, quote, 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 systemic change. But Adams now opposes the plan to close Rikers by 2027. His argument is that too many people are incarcerated at Rikers for them to close the jail by then, because wherever would we put these people who haven't been convicted of a crime while they await their trial? I mean, I imagine that we could put them in the same place that we put rich people accused of the crimes, their fucking house. But let's explore his argument. Rikers was only built to hold 3,000 people, but it currently contains approximately 5,500 people. That is why the cells are packed looking like this. New York City's landmark bail reform addressed this issue by eliminating cash bail for most misdemeanors, low-level offenses, and nonviolent crimes. In turn, Riker's population was drastically reduced, a necessary step to closing the jail. According to New York City Comptroller's Office, there has been essentially no change in the monthly percentage of people rearrested while pending trial after bail reform. And yet, and yet, and yet, unfounded fear-mongering by people like Adams has brought about rollbacks that rose the population about 7 to 11%, precisely so we can keep the Rikers population high 
then use it as his justification for why the jail can't close anytime soon. It's evil world we live in. Yeah, let me let me also say it's like bail reform, you know, has has become this like flashpoint, using heavy air quotes, um, and it's like this 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 debate: who's for you know decarceration or who's like for you know safety? Like who you know? And and here's the reality of of it's not just you know not just bail reform, but when we talk about policing and when we talk about um, surveillance and we talk about probation and parole, we talk about all these things that intersect with the criminal legal system, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is public health and public safety. And there's this perception that folks who are like advocating and talking about bail reform, you and me, don't care about public health and safety. And that's outrageous. I mean, do I have to go out and say like, I care about New York City. I lived there for 20 years, recently moved, but like I had a child there. Do I need to like, and my whole family lives there to like prove to you that I actually don't want people getting hurt or my family to be at risk? Like, no, I obviously want public health and safety. And because of that, it's important that like we, I, all of us follow facts. If it turned out that bail reform and bail reform is just pretrial freedom, extra services in New York, it's just um, uh, folks that are charged with the lowest level uh, misdemeanor or misdemeanors and the lowest level felonies are released. If we just go by the facts, um, it is enormously successful when it comes to health and safety. It proves that you can maximize both freedom, justice, racial justice, and cost savings and, and everything. It's like, it's like the perfect thing. And, and, and yet um, people think that it, that it does the opposite. Instead, knowing what we know now, though, it's not just like I support it because I care about safety, because I care about health, because I care about human beings, because I care about fiscal responsibility, all those things. We should be expanding it, not limiting it, not pulling and whatever. We should be expanding it. And yet we're not, and we're fighting to just like, just hold on to one of the best public policies for health and safety in the history of the country. One that Democrats could and stand could stand behind and should stand behind and educate their voters. And instead, we're lying to the people. Eric Adams is lying to the people um, about what decarceration actually means, what this policy actually means. And what it's doing is it's causing us to just continue to make the same damn mistakes at enormous cost, fiscal and human costs that we continue to make. That's why I hate Eric Adams. Stop it, man. Adams continues to oppose bail reform and asks lawmakers to pass more restrictive laws that would increase Rikers' already sky-high population, as well as appoint more tough-on-crime judges. That is not the conduct of someone who has any interest in lowering the jail's population to facilitate its closing, despite acknowledging that it's already thousands of people too high and has caused deaths, violence, suicide, and rampant abuse. He's also fighting off calls for a receivership. So what is a receivership? A receivership would allow the court to appoint a nonpartisan expert who is given wide latitude to address the crisis and be answerable only to the court, and not state and local laws and bureaucratic agencies, which would allow them to make progress in ways that the city personnel could not. In other words, they wouldn't be strapped by all of the kind of red tape and minutia. And then once brought up to constitutional standards, the control of Rikers would then automatically revert to the state and locality. So here's what pisses me off about Eric Adams, Rikers, and the receivership. This motherfucker knows that Rikers is out of control. He knows it. He knows it. He knows it. And the only fucking reason this dickhead doesn't want Rikers to be placed under receivership is because of the number one thing he cares about, power. Eric Adams simply cannot cede control of Rikers long enough to save people's lives because he doesn't like the idea of admitting that he cannot handle the problem. Ego, power, that's all it is. So a lot of people, um, including I think yourself and myself, support federal receivership for Rikers Island. Um, it's not uh, to say that we don't want Rikers Island to also close, but I think our concern is while it's open and while we're getting there, uh, it needs to be reformed as soon as possible so that people are safe. It's a harm reduction strategy. And anybody who cares about their constituents and who cares about people in custody and who cares about staff, actually, who are working on Rikers Island should support receivership uh, because it's the only thing at this point that would work. And his response has been all about himself and all about his ego. 
the first thing that came out of his mouth when he was interviewed about federal receivership was, well, what does that say about me? If I can't, you know, if you're taking away Rikers Island from me, you're saying I can't do a good job. Well, it's not about you, though. It's about getting the job done safely and humanely. Yes, he's a fucking egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to sum up, to sum up. And you know what? It's very sad because, again, you know, he claims to stand with the union and to stand with the union members, which is the staff. And by the way, I'm not anti-staff either, necessarily. I know that they work hard and that some of them are doing the wrong thing, but some of them are doing the right thing. And the entire place is problematic for anybody who steps foot in there whether you are a detainee a staff member a visitor a contractor anybody and anybody without you know choosing their ego over doing the right thing would be able to admit that and it's very hard for him to admit it and it's unfortunate um you know and we're, the hope is that with the involvement of the federal monitor and the you know the plaintiffs in the Nunez consent decree, so you know legal aid, etc. Um, that with the push for federal receivership, the judge will you know be willing to realize that this is not that this is the better path receivership, yeah. and that you know the only reason that the city is not going for it is because of an ego trip, which is horrific reason. Right, exactly, and I think and I think that's the thing that people mistake when I said I'm like I hate Eric Adams for substantive reasons he <laughs> materially is in the way he yeah. is actively preventing us from doing the things and it's for vocally shallow reasons in this need to the, the it's not just that we call Eric Adams a cop because he was a cop or to be arbitrary just because I hate cops all that is true but <laughs> but it's but it's because he goes out of his way to constantly reinforce us that that is his team like that is his number one priority and i see it every time and it's not a staffing shortage either that is a popular misconception constantly floated about rikers they are big on abusing the sick leave policy and commissioner molina facilitates it he stops suspending officers for being a wall and taking illegal sick leaves and he appointed assistant deputy warden wayne price who has been under a two-year investigation for stealing time to oversee the sick leave investigation. So as many experts have already said, the there is no shortage of staff on Rikers Island. It's the most richly staffed jail in the country. Um, it's about a one-to-one -one or a little bit more than a one-to-one -one ratio from officer to um, detainee. And the problem that Rikers has is favoritism and people just not knowing how to manage the staff numbers that they have. There are people who take advantage of sick leave. There are people who take advantage of, um, you know, just knowing the right people. So they get a cushy gig. And even though they're a correction officer, they don't actually work in the jails. Um, one of my favorite stories is from when I was still working there and Vincent Chiraldi was our commissioner. And we call it the Columbus Day Massacre because it happened on Columbus Day when Commissioner Shiraldi came and realized that he, there were some pretty badly unstaffed posts on Rikers Island. Um, and because it was Columbus Day, the courts were closed and therefore the correction officers who worked in the courts were not really needed there. Uh, obviously, the courts closed, right? Yeah. Um, and there were like 10 correction officers assigned there and he um, went there and said, you know, you need to go back, you need to be redeployed to Rikers Island because you're not needed here in the courts. You are needed on Rikers Island. And all of a sudden, they all came down with ailments that required them to call an ambulance to take them off of Rikers Island. Um, and the most offensive part, which I love so much, is not only did they all come down with ailments immediately, uh, as soon as they were told to redeploy, one person actually went to his car that was parked at Rikers Island and pulled out a cane so that when the ambulance arrived, he could show just how badly injured he was and therefore he could not work. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when when they say that, that there's not enough staffing, a lot of it is because people are not coming to work. Um, and what Commissioner Molina will do, again, with the fuzzy math and, you know, convincing people that he's doing better when he's not, is he'll say something along the lines of this. He'll say, oh, well, before I came here, X number of people were out sick. Let's say, you know, 300 people were out sick. Uh, and now only 100 people are out sick. Therefore, I have more staff working. 
But the truth is, a lot of those people who were out sick, who are now not out sick, they're not working. They've either been fired or they've resigned or whatever. So, you know, it's a it's a nice little omission of the facts that allows the commissioner to say that I've been improving things when really you still have these unstaffed posts. I have people talking to me all the time about this, whether yeah. it's a clients or staff members who reach out to me. Um, there's on staff posts all of the time, and it's not because they don't have the staff necessarily. It's that they're not hiring correctly and because they're not managing the staff that they do have correctly. And exploiting that sick leave policy, right? Like Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I want to talk about what you had just said before, uh, because I think you're going to love it about Eric Adams being a hypocrite, yeah. because let's talk about what you just said. You said that Eric Adams was out defending these correction officers and police officers who do harm to people, like kill them, you know, yeah. shoot them and kill them, right? Then he'll also say out of that same mouth that the people who are on Rikers Island deserve to be there, even though they haven't been convicted yet because they've done horrible, horrible things. Well, you and I both know because of our work as defense attorneys that most people, including that correction officer or police officer who killed or shot that person would otherwise normally be on Rikers Island, not getting defended by the mayor to, you know, not, not be charged, not have bail set, all that stuff. So to me and to you, and I think to rational people, we look at that and we say, well, who's on Rikers Island then? Just the people that you don't defend? Because I know there's a lot of people on Rikers Island who've done way less than shoot somebody with a gun. Despite the fact that New York City has proved incapable of stopping or even slowing the mounting atrocities at Rikers, Eric Adams continues to resist calls for a federal receivership that would give Rikers the necessary overhaul it needs. Instead, he's continually called for increases to Rikers' already $860 million yearly budget for the prison and the $2.6 billion given to its staff so he could hire more officers. Adams has continued to make the argument that the reason for the crisis at Rikers is a staffing shortage, when in reality, there are 5,600 people detained at Rikers, but there are 7,575 corrections officers. They have literally thousands more corrections officers than they have incarcerated people. There is not a staffing shortage. And while he wants to increase the money for corrections officers, just to drive it home to us just how much he doesn't give a fuck about the people suffering at Rikers, he recently announced that he will be eliminating classes and re-entry services at Rikers. The Gothamist reported, The Adams administration is eliminating programs that help detainees get jobs, find housing, stay off drugs, and reconnect with loved ones once they're released from Rikers Island in order to save $17 million in next year's budget. We were blindsided and in shock, said Ronald Day, vice president of programs at the Fortune Society, one of the five nonprofit agencies informed on Monday that their contracts, due to expire next year, were suddenly nixed. The canceled classes covered training and carpentry and plumbing skills, financial literacy, cognitive behavioral therapy, drug relapse prevention, and anger management. The last day of class will be June 30th. Dozens of full-time employees who work daily in the jails, including the formerly incarcerated, will lose their positions. Some of the programs operated in various forms at Rikers and the floating jail in the East River for decades. The agency's contracts together make up just 1.4% of the Department of Corrections' $1.2 billion budget. But the cuts were ordered by Eric Adams, who has tasked city agencies with eliminating 4% in spending. It is mismanagement. It is neglect. It is cruelty. It is ego. But most importantly, it is just about power. Oh, listen. I may not have got into your favorite personal reason for why you hate Eric Adams. I am so sorry, but believe you me, there are a million. I had a database of like 5,000 articles of every time this nigga didn't get on my fucking nerves to coon through to pick what to put in here. So trust me, a lot was left on the cutting room floor. But I did ask my Twitter followers why they hated Eric Adams. So I wanted to at least put some of those answers. So here are some honorable mentions before I give y'all my final thoughts. If you made it to the end of this video, <laughs> if you made it all the way to the end of this video, damn, <laughs> you really a hater for real, son. You a hater for real, but I like that. 
I like that. <laughs> I like that. Ooh, 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 what you gonna do? Okay, okay. I'm sorry. This y'all don't know how much work this was. I hope that this has been a very productive look into why everybody with good sense knows that Eric Adams is a conch shell. I feel like this is a really New York City video, so Raheem should make an appearance as a true New York City cat. I adopted Raheem from Bushwick Cats. He used to be a kingpin of the streets of Bushwick. And we are also big, big proponents of Flatbush Cats who recently opened a veterinary clinic. So shout out to them. Hemi, say, Hemi. Be nice. Say hi to the camera, Lord. Say hi.